Okay, hello everyone. This is the Human Mind Project again. Um, last last video we talked about uh, the origins of psychology, Sigmund Freud, the psychoanalytic theory. We're going to change it up a little bit and talk about more of a social psychology uh, topic, something that I think is a bit more relatable um, and a bit less scientific. Um, so we're going to go over the dual process approaches to persuasion. So there are two kinds of uh, models that we'll look at for persuasion and how people are persuaded. Um, and so they'll look at examples like right here, it just says Adolf Hitler and his way of persuasion, George Bernard Shaw, uh, and many other examples that are featured in the in the chapter. Okay. Um, so these are the two models, the elaboration likelihood and heuristic systematic systemic models. Um, I'm just going to set my clock here. Yeah, so <clears throat> the two important theoretical models were developed in the in the 80s to explain how people change their attitudes in response to persuasive messages. Richard Petty and John Cacioppo's elaboration likelihood model, which is one of the models we'll be talking about, and Shelley uh, Chaikin's heuristic systematic model. Although the two theories were developed independently and used different terminology, they converge with respect to the core idea that people sometimes process persuasive messages rather mindlessly and effortlessly and sometimes very deeply and intently. Right. So if you think about it, sometimes uh, if you're being persuaded into something you may not even know you're being persuaded into it. You may just kind of go with go with the flow. Um, or sometimes you may think very deeply about it uh, and follow all the details. Um, so does this dual process distinction sound familiar? It should. It's, an, it's analogous to the one we discussed uh, in a previous chapter, which we won't be going over and will encounter again later between automatic and controlled processing. When applied to persuasion, the key insight is that some types of persuasive appeals will be more effective when the target audience is largely on autopilot, and other types will be more effective when the target is alert and attentive. Indeed, the very name elaboration likelihood model captures the idea that in trying to predict whether a persuasive message will be effective, it is essential to know whether the target audience is likely to elaborate, think deeply about the message, or process it mindlessly, because the two models are similar in terms of their basic postulates. For the sake of convenience, we organize our discussion of the dual process underlying persuasion around the elaboration likelihood model. So according to ELM, the central route to persuasion, known as the systemic route, occurs when people think carefully and deliberately about the content of a persuasive message. So it's systemic. It's very We can break this down very easily. If you had to remember this definition, the systemic route occurs when people are thinking systematically. They're breaking it down from phase one through the last phase, they're thinking carefully and deliberately about the content of, of the entire message that they're uh, receiving. They intend, they attend to the logic and strength of the arguments and evidence contained in the message. They bring relevant information of their own experiences, memories, and images to the process of evaluating the message. All of this high effort thinking or elaboration of the message may lead to a change in attitude, or it may not. But in any case, there's a careful sifting of the arguments and, in, and evidence presented. Through ELM's peripheral route, which is also known as the heuristic route, people primarily attend to peripheral aspects of a message, uh, relatively superficial, easy to process features of a persuasive communication that are uh, tangible basically, tangital, to the persuasive information itself. So we can look at this diagram here, right? So motivation, this is easier than reading the text. 
Uh, so motivation and ability factors. So the issue is personally uh, relevant and the person is knowledgeable in the domain. So they're going to use a central systematic way to break this down. And the way that the person's attitude would be changed would be through quality of the argument. So if, if I'm, for example, very knowledgeable in a certain sport uh, and I'm rooting for a certain team and someone is trying to persuade me to cheer for the opposite team, um, this issue is personally relevant to me. Uh, I'm knowledgeable in this domain and so is the person I'm talking to. So we're going to break this down logically in a systemic fashion or systematic fashion. Um, and I'm, I'm going to hope that the person talking to me has a better quality of argument than I do for why I should cheer for their team. Whereas if we look at the peripheral one, uh, if you if you break down peripheral, right, it's in your, it's in the back, it's not in your it's not top of mind. It's not at the front. You can't see it. The issue is not personally relevant as opposed to the central one. You get distracted or fatigued when hearing about it. Uh, it's incomplete. It's hard to comprehend. Um, it's not very clear. Okay. That's why it's not at the top of your mind. The way we would get someone to be persuaded by this would be through how attractive the attractiveness, the fame, or the expertise on this issue, the number and length of the arguments, and basically what's the general consensus, what's everybody saying around us. So as you can see, the central version versus the peripheral are very different, and they can be broken down very differently as well. So the roles of motivation and ability, right? So this is going to be a central question to... Um, to this chapter and to what we're talking about. So what determines whether we will engage in central or peripheral processing? In response to a persuasive message, there are two primary factors that matter, motivation and ability. In terms of our motivation to devote time and energy to a message, when the message has personal consequences, it bears on our goals, interests, or well-being. We're more likely to go through the central route and carefully work through the arguments and relevant information. So here's a great example here. Um, you be the subject, central and peripheral persuasion tactics. Central and peripheral persuasion tactics are used widely. Um, <coughs> so if you go to this, the greenpeace.org website, it's a website that gives tips on green living and see if you can identify content that is intended to persuade through the central route, as well as cues likely to persuade through the peripheral route. So this is a great example. And you can, whoever's watching this video, if you want to partake in this, you can list uh, central route tactics and peripheral route tactics uh, to see, uh, to kind of test if you can see what the greenpeace.org is uh, doing, right? So the results are also listed here, but we won't go through it, obviously, because you have to actually go through the activity. So in terms of our ability to process the message in depth, uh, when, when we have sufficient cognitive resources and time, we're able to process persuasive messages more deeply. Our knowledge about an attitude issue or subject also affects the ability factor, right? So this, moving aside from the text, this line here would be perfect for your system, systematic breakdown, right? So your knowledge of the subject, your knowledge on the attitude and the issue, it affects, it affects everything about uh, what we're being persuaded on, right? In contrast, when ability is low, the arguments in a, pers in a persuasive message are being presented too quickly or are hard to comprehend. We're more apt to rely on easy to process peripheral cues associated with the message, message, such as the credentials of the message source. Being tired or distracted also makes peripheral processing more likely, right? So if I'm tired, for example, or if you're watching this and you're tired of reading this text or learning about the subject, you aren't going to keep listening. You're going to keep this in the back as white noise and 
you may not be interested in learning about psychology or social psychology. The upshot is that for persuasion to occur via the central route, we have to be both motivated and able to engage in more in-depth processing if either or both is lacking. Persuasion generally relies on peripheral cues. Let's take a look at how social psychologists examine the roles of motivation and ability. In a typical experiment testing the ELM approach to persuasion, researchers first generate strong and weak arguments for an attitude issue or object. They then present these arguments as part of a persuasive message. They also vary the potency of various peripheral cues associated with the message, such as the number of arguments offered or the fame, attractiveness, or appeal of the source of the message. Finally, they vary a factor such as the personal relevance of the issue to manipulate the likelihood that the participants will process the message centrally or peripherally. If participants process the message via the central route to persuasion because the issue has a great deal of personal relevance, they should be sensitive to the strength of the arguments, swayed when the arguments are strong but not when they're weak. Participants who are low in motivation or ability or both would be unlikely to discern the strength of the argument because they are noticing only the peripheral cues of the message. As a result, whether or not they change their attitudes is less affected by argument's strength. And we're going to stop here for this video and we'll continue on the next one. Actually, we'll end here uh, with the Aristotle quote. It's very interesting. So one of the modes of persuasion furnished by the spoken word, there are three kinds. The first kind depends on the personal character of the speaker. The second on putting the audience into a certain frame of mind. And the third on the proof provided by the words of the speech itself. So if you Aristotle here, you could perfectly categorize a lawyer, a salesperson, even a teacher uh, into the three ways that we could three modes that we could persuade somebody. Uh, we'll leave off with that and we'll continue in the next video.